Or now? Now can you hear me? Um, had uh, I love my church dinner last Wednesday night. That was great, wasn't it? Boy, that was a good meal. And uh, we appreciate you being here tonight. And uh, we're going to study tonight on uh, forgiveness. How's that? Let's go to Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. Chapter 18. And down about verse 21, we'll pick up there. Forgiveness. It's not always easy, is it? Hmm. Even though we know that it's a must in our Christian walk, but and we expect others to forgive us, but it's not always easy. Because we're still finite human beings uh, created in the image of God, but we all suffered the fall in Adam. And uh, so Jesus, he addressed this. And uh, in verse 21, we'll start there. And if you have a question, they may not hear you on the YouTube or on uh, Facebook, but I will try to repeat it and answer it. And uh, we'll go through the scriptures down to about verse 35. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. Till seven times. Now, Peter had, was reducing the love of God to logic. God expects us to forgive because we love, right? And that's really the only reason that we have been forgiven for God so loved the world. And the only reason he expects us to forgive is through love. Uh, but Peter had made it, um, instead of spiritual, mathematical, seven times. If my brother sins against me, do I forgive him seven times? Now, when you study this, you'll see that the rabbis that Peter had set under and all of Israel had been taught by spiritually and under the law said three times, three times. And their logic was that in the, the number three in the Hebrew numerical system is a number that's closely related to seven in what it means and stands for. Some say it's the number of the worship of God. You know, when Isaiah saw God, he said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And, but it also is a number of emphasis. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Uh, so they say three is enough. Three times is enough. If your brother sins against you, three times is enough. So Peter, he stepped out. He's Mr. Peter, right? And he's going to go above and beyond. Like he said, I'm ready to die with you, go to prison with you. I'm going to die with you, Lord. Before the cock crowed in the morning, he had already denied him three times, right? I'm going to walk on the water with you. And here I sit and criticize the one that's got the second record in all the world on walking on water, Peter. But he walked for a little while, didn't he? Now, so he jumps up and says, do I forgive seven times? That's complete forgiveness, right? It's how God looks at Israel and all of us. They're one of my favorite prophecies, you've heard me talk about it, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon my people, my people's Israel, and upon the holy city, the J Jerusalem, to make an end of transgression, to anoint the most holy, to bring in everlasting righteousness, uh, to make an end of sin, to stop the transgression, to make an end of sin. Seventy-sevens, 490 years when you look at the prophecy. Seventy-seven of, uh, uh, weeks of years, 490 years. The first, which is 70 weeks, 490 years, uh, weeks of year. The first 69 weeks... He made provision for forgiveness, didn't he? 69th week, the Messiah was cut off, died for our sin. 
But he's been forgiving Israel ever since, right? Right through the church age. And he's forgiven all of us until those 70 weeks are fulfilled and then there will be complete forgiveness. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense, don't it? So here we go. Peter said, do I forgive seven times? He really stepped out. Uh, God, when he began to speak here, he moved forgiveness beyond the natural because he's going to go way beyond what natural, the natural man's ability is able to do. It's how God forgives, right? He get, forgives us beyond the natural. God is a spirit. And God has complete forgiveness. And he can forgive and will over and over and over and over again. And so, uh, and that's how we should be. And this is what he's going to teach us tonight. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times. Now that's a big deal. Peter was stating, that's a big deal to forgive seven times. But let me ask you this. Where would you be if God only forgave you seven times? You wouldn't be sitting here tonight. You'd be out there probably running after the world, hell bent, sin, hell bent, uh, sin ridden, uh, hell bent. Um, where would I be? Shannon, where would I be? You can answer that question, Shannon, because you're in the same place. We all are. If God only forgave me, now he complete, he forgave me when I called upon him and he forgave my sin. But did John say if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness? You know what? John knew in his day, God knew in that day, and we all know today that God forgives us over and over and over again. And if he didn't, we'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? Right? That's exactly right. Now look, that's exactly right. Only way we'd make it, Shannon said, is if he just took us out. Right after we were saved. I remember uh, being in a revival. I wasn't a pastor. I was just a member of, uh, Gen of uh, Oak Ridge General Baptist Church. We had a big revival. 26, I'll never forget. 26 saved. 26 saved. I'm telling you, it was one of the most supernatural things I'd ever been a part of. And um, I forget how many nights, but a lot of my buddies was saved. I, I was, me and Carolyn were just new Christians. And uh, one night, there was like 13 saved one night, and different ones said the house literally shook. I didn't feel it. Maybe I wasn't holy enough at that time, but I didn't feel it, but others did. And, and my buddy Gary Ferris, who's gone on to be with the Lord, my brother, I'm telling you what, I love that boy. Uh, he got saved that night. But uh, So anyway, fast forward. The, the evangelist come back, Brother James Kerr from out of up in Gray Center, Edmondson County. He came back the next year and a bunch of them had backslid, right? So he was at this one person's house. He goes back. Back then, the evangelist went around, knocked on doors, visited people, and invited them to church. And this one old boy, whom I won't call his name, was, hadn't come back to church. And he told him, he said, I ought to drown you when I baptized you. You'd have been better off. So that's what we're talking about here. God would have to just take us out, you know, if there wasn't forgiveness after our initial conversion. So I'm thankful that God is a forgiving God. He said, I say not until seven times, but until 70 times seven, 490. Has anybody that you know sinned against you 490 times? Hmm. Mm, I can't think of anybody, you know. Now, I may have somebody, but I can't think of anybody. So it, that's complete forgiveness. I mean, if you will forgive 490 times a person that has... That's through love and beyond nature. And so you would forgive 400 and... I mean, 4,090 times. Does that make sense? If you would forgive that many times, and Jesus has called us to be that type of individual and to be that saved and spiritual then you'd have complete forgiveness and that's what God is saying I will and so should you 490 times and so he begins to tell stories and he began uh, to talk about 
uh, an individual that had sinned. There is the, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had began to reckon, begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. That is an astronomical amount of money. A talent is the heaviest weight in Hebrew measurement. The heaviest weight. And, and 10,000 is the highest round number in the Hebrew, at that time, in the Hebrew uh, numerical system. 10,000. John looked into heaven and he saw thousands upon and tens of thousands, didn't he? It's always tens of, it's never millions or trillions or billions like the national debt. It's 10,000. So he said, this man owed, he owed 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, his wife, his children, and they all, and that he had and payment to be made. He couldn't make it. He couldn't make the payment. Let me tell you why. That was 300 years of a laborer's wages at the time of Jesus. 300 years. I did the math. It would take six lifetimes if he started working, lived to be 75 and started working at the age of 18 out of high school and every dime went to this debt. It would take him six lifetimes None of us have six lifetimes, so we can't pay the debt. That old adage, how does it go? I owed a debt I could not, he paid a debt that I could not pay because I, you know how it goes. I never could, I'm like the president, I never could get that in right, you know. Um, but uh, he did. Six lifetimes started working at age 18 out of high school. Every dime goes to this king and he would never live enough lifetimes to pay it. So they're going to sell him. They're going to sell his wife. They're going to sell his children. They're going to sell his farm. They're going to sell his house. They're going to take it all. So what can he do? Now he's under the law. He's under the law. This, they could do it. They could do this under the law. What could he do? The only thing he could do is fall upon the mercy of the court, right? So the servant therefore fell down and worshipped the king, saying, Lord, oh, please have patience with me. Don't sell my wife. Don't sell my kids. You can take my farm, take my house. Don't sell my family. Don't sell them. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. You know what the word compassion there means? When Jesus stood over on the hill of, uh, uh, of Mount Olive, perhaps, and he looked at Jerusalem, and he saw the people as a, a sheep without a shepherd, it says he was moved with compassion. And you know what the word literally means out of the Hebrew there? And out of the Greek here? That his bowels, his stomach, his guts wrenched within him. When he saw Israel without a shepherd, he knew what was coming. And it made him sick to his stomach. That's what this king, when he looked at this guy, it tore him up inside. He had compassion. He was a good king. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave his debt. All he asked was for more time, right? He just asked for patience. But he got forgiveness. He got forgiveness. So you would think he would learn a lesson from this. But here's what happened. But that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed oh, ought him an hundred pence. And he lay hands on him and took him by the throat saying, Pay me that thou owest. A hundred pence. You know how much that is? How much that was? Three months wages. Anybody could have worked it out. Anybody. Three months wages compared to what he was forgiven. 300 years. And his fellow 
servant fell down at his feet and besought him. Same prayer, asked the same thing that this fellow asked of the king. And he said, have patience with me. Give me some time. Just give me some time. I will pay you. And he would not. But he went and he cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when the fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorrowful and came and told their Lord all that was done. All that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgive thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Boy, he had him. He was guilty, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. How often should we forgive those that trespass? Anybody sitting here that you got something in your life towards someone and they really wronged you? I mean, they really wronged you. They did. I've been there. I've struggled with it. I've prayed prayer after prayer. It's not easy to give it up. Because there's always this voice back here that justifies your feelings. And it's not the voice of God. The voice of God is saying, forgive. Because you know what that cancer that's eating at you toward those people is doing? It's just eating you away. It's doing nothing to that person that has wronged you. Forgiveness is as much for those that forgive than it is the one that receives forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good God, isn't he, Sammy? You know, it's always quiet in a in a uh, class like this because we can all relate to it, can't we? We've all been hurt. We've been scarred. And probably we've all hurt people, you know. And we justify it. This boy, if we could, if, if, the, if this king, if the, his Lord had to give him a chance to talk, he would have spun it and tried to justify what he had done. But he brought conviction. of Just like the night I was saved. You know, I wasn't the worst among sinners, but except I repent, I perish like the worst among sinners. You know, they could say, Gary didn't drink and Gary didn't run around on, Gary didn't do this. But boy, I had squandered away a life that God had given me. And I sinned against God and I sinned against my fellow men, man. And, and I owed a debt I couldn't pay, couldn't pay it. And God didn't give me the chance to say, well, you know what, I'm going to do better. He convicted me of my sin through the preaching of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. And I saw myself lost and on my way to hell. And now he's doing the same to this guy. You should have forgave. I forgave you. You should have forgiven that person. Well, you don't know what he's done. doesn't matter. He didn't ask him what he had done to him. And look, he's about to sentence him not for the crime that he committed against the king but for the crime that he committed against his fellow man. And the, and the penalty was going to be great. Just like in our court system. You know, three strikes and you're out. It starts piling up after a while. Your, your sins and your crimes in, in the court system. And the judges frown on that. This old boy had a chance. He was forgiven. And he squandered that away by not forgiving. Being forgiving. 
Shouldest thou not also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, angry, and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. I mean, he's going to be punished until he pays the debt that he can't pay. That's what hell is going to be like. People don't go to hell for being bad people. People go to hell for being lost, for not being saved and believing the Lord Jesus and being saved. And then they're going to be tormented for that debt of sin until they can pay. And they can't pay, right? You can never pay. It's like I asked the lady at the hospital the other day. She said, I, I, I'm better than I was. And I said, are you good enough to go to heaven? And she just broke down. I said, neither am I. I'm not either. I'm not good enough to go to heaven. I need forgiveness. I don't need more time to get better. I need forgiveness. And that's what God gives us. Because he knows us. And he knows we can't get it right. But he did. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Right? Right? You want to have a strong church? Be a forgiving church. Be a forgiving church. And I know, look, I know. You say, well, I can forgive, but I can't forget. God knows that. He knows that. And some will say, well, you haven't forgiven unless you can forget it. That's not true. It's not true. But when forgiveness has come, it's when the animosity stops. The hatred the turmoil that it causes in your soul when you think about what somebody has done to you. You may live with the scar all of your life, but you don't have to live with that grudge that you have against that person. Anybody with any questions? Any questions? Anything? He's a good God, isn't he? It is. That's right. We'll never, we'll never match it. Never. I was asked a question the last time we were here. I was here. And I, I should have tried to answer it then and uh, the lady is not here tonight that asked the question, but I want to go ahead and try to answer it. Um, and maybe she's watching. Um, I was talking about, we were talking about love, if you remember. And the mother of, of uh, James and John asked Jesus, could her son sit at his right hand and his left when he comes to his kingdom? And I said, she was, her name was Salome. She was the wife of Zebedee. James and John were the sons of Zebedee. Now there's three James, and, and so the question was asked, um, the question was asked out of verse 56 of Matthew's gospel. And these were the women that went to Calvary and was mourning Jesus, Mary Magdalene, mother, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children, which would have been Salome. Which this person asked the question, was that, was Salome, did Salome have another name, Mary? And I just kind of passed it on and, and went on, which I shouldn't have had, and it hit me before I got home that I should have answered her question or tried uh, it does say Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. But there are three James mentioned in the New Testament. Two of them were disciples. There was James, um, this, uh, the son of Zebedee, and it's 
mentioned over and over. Most of the time when his name is mentioned in the Gospels, it identifies him as the son of Zebedee. Why? Because they didn't have last names like we do here in the Western world. And so they identified them by their father's name or their grandfather's name. The other James, he was also a disciple, and he was the son of Alphaeus. And he's mentioned also when in Matthew 2, where the list of the disciples are there, these two Jameses were identified. Zebedee's boys and James the lesser, he was called, was uh, by Mark, he was called James the lesser. Why was he called the son of Zebedee? I'm sorry, the son of Alphaeus was. Why? Because he was younger. That's how they identified him. If there was two James, like... In my family, I, have a, I had a brother, James, and I had a cousin, first cousin named James, or Jimmy, I should say. We called them Jimmys. Well, little Jimmy was my cousin. He was younger, and so he went by little Jimmy. And the lesser or the younger in the New Testament, they would identify them as which they, one they were. So the answer to the question is, Mother Mary, the mother of James... The question was, is this Salome? No, this is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Because Jesus had brothers, James, Joseph, Judah, and Simeon, I believe it is. Four brothers and had two sisters, I believe. And I'm doing this by memory, which is not as good as it used to be. Um, so this Mary here in 56 is the mother of Jesus. Uh, at, and the mother of Zebedee's children there at the end of the verse, it doesn't give her name, but she is Salome. Salome, the wife of Zebedee. So I wanted to answer that question, and if she doesn't watch this and she'll be back next week, uh, we'll go through it again. Uh, does all that make sense? You can get confused. There's three Jameses. One of them wasn't a disciple. One of them was the brother of Jesus. And if I look at the scriptures right, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It was uh, James the Lesser that wrote the book of James. The, no, I'm sorry. The son of Zebedee that wrote the book of James who was killed later. And jo this Joseph or Jude wrote the book of Jude, which was the half-brother of Jesus. And, and you be, be careful when you research, especially on the Internet. I did some of that today. And you'll get in trouble because I brought up this one page and it, they was talking about the Jameses and this writer said that these brothers and sisters were by a previous marriage, Joseph's first marriage. Now, why would they teach that? I'm going to tell you why they teach that. Is because there's a lot of people out there that believe that Mary remained a virgin. She is called the Virgin Mary unto this day. That's wrong. She ceased to be a... In the New Testament, this is not Garyology or something that I think is right. It's there in the New Testament. All through it, different places, uh, the brothers and the sisters of Jesus, uh, the, the children of Mary, the children of Mary. Well, right here it is. Well, here it could have been Mary's stepchildren, you know, but it's not. It, they're identified later as her children. Okay. I hope I didn't confuse you, but those are the Jameses. The sons of Zebedee, the, sons of, the son of Aphias, and the son of Joseph and Mary, who did not become a believer till later in Jesus' life, in his ministry. He couldn't wrap his mind around that this was the Messiah. So he wasn't a disciple, one of the original 12. Okay? All right. No questions? Do you think he was the head of the church in Jerusalem? I haven't read that before. That the brother, yeah, some argue that he was or say they, that he was. Um, but it was now the one that James, the one that Herod killed, Acts chapter 12 was John's brother. Yeah, yeah. John's brother, the son of Zebedee. Remember he said, and I taught this on that lesson, are you able to eat of the same 
bread that I eat of and drink of the same drink? And they, she said, yeah, yeah, they are. And he said, I agree, they are. Because they died. He knew that they would die a martyr's death. They'd give their life for the cause. And James uh, did. And the rest of them did too. But Okay. The Bible's good stuff, ain't it? It's good stuff. We love you guys. Any, anything else? Any announcements? Anything at all? Before we pray, any prayer requests? The camera is off, isn't it, hon?